Hey, Numa family. Hey, peeps. How are you doing? <laughs> we are super excited to be here with you this morning. As you can see, we are tag teaming it. Tag team. Back again. <laughs> Before we dig into the scripture this morning, we're going to take a little bit of time, 30 seconds. Um, just get still, get quiet, and prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from God this morning. God, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together as a community um, and to hear your word. I pray that through the scripture and through the message this morning that we would hear your voice loud and clear, that you would speak into each of our individual situations. Um, it's in Jesus' name that I ask these things. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to be in Ruth chapter 3 verses what? 5 through 18. 5 through 18, and we're going to be in the NIV. But as you go in there, you turn it there. I want to give you some background around what's happening and what's going on. So there is a famine that's going on in the land of Israel. And there's a man by the name of Elimelech. Can you say that really fast three Elimelech, times? Elimelech, Elimelech, Elimelech. <laughs> so he sees the conditions that are going on in his area, and he decides to move his family to Moab. He's thinking, hey, maybe there's... Uh, a, a better life, therefore, is we can find food, we can find a job. So he moves him and his wife, Naomi, um, and also his two sons. So they move there, and as they move to Moab, he passes away. Mm -hmm. And so Naomi is left with these two sons. So this is still good for her because there's, during this time, in order to have some sort of inheritance and wealth within the family, you needed to have a male. All right, so there's still these two sons in the family. They end up marrying two Moabite women, one named Orpah and another one named Ruth. But 10 years later, they end up passing away. So the two sons pass away. Wow. And now it's just Naomi left with her two daughter-in-laws from Moab. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to navigate life, figure this thing out. They've experienced, <laughs> yeah, they're grieving. Baby. They've experienced a lot of, like loss in their life. Mm. And Naomi hears that God is back into the, the, the Israelite community and he's serving them and there's a harvest that's going on. So she decides to take the two daughters with her back, home. To, back, home. back home. And as she's going, she turns to her two daughter-in-laws and she says, go back to your family. Yeah. I, I can't do anything for you, I'm old. If I have another child right now, he's going to be too young. Like things are, they just not going to be well for you. Mm. And so they, they both say, no, <laughs> we're not going to leave you. Uh, and then Naomi says it again. And then Orpah, she decides to leave. Mm. But Ruth says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm staying. Your people are going to be my people. Your God is going to be my God. I'm going with you. I'm going to stay faithful to you. Yeah. So they go back into the town. It is harvest season um, and things are happening and growing. And Ruth turns to Naomi and she says, hey, let me try to go find us some food. Let me try to go and see if we can work some things out uh, for the family. And so she goes and she goes into the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz. And Boaz notices Ruth and he tells the workers to help her out. He tells Ruth not to leave the workers. He shows Ruth favor. Yeah. And Ruth goes back and she tells Naomi who this man was and all these things that are happening. And this is what we're going to pick up here in the scripture. So again, we're in chapter 3, verses 5 through 18. It says, I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Mm. <laughs> Around <laughs> midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman 
lying at his feet. I would be too. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she re mm. replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you have not gone after a younger man, mm. whether rich or poor. Now don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary, for everyone in town knows you are a virtuous woman. But while it's true that I am one of your family redeemers, there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I will talk to him. If he's willing to redeem you, very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, he's then not. as surely as the Lord lives, I will <laughs> redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until the morning, but she got up before it was light enough for people to recognize each other. For Boaz had said, no one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. Then Boaz said to her, bring your cloak and spread it out. He measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back. Then he returned to the town. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, what happened, my daughter? Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. And she added, he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Mm. Then Naomi said to her, just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. The man won't rest until he has settled things today. God, we thank you. Um, we thank you for this passage of scripture. We thank you for the story of Ruth. Um, we thank you for its relevance even in our lives today, God. And as we reflect on it, I just pray, God, that we would hear from you clearly today, that our hearts and our minds would be open to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So this month, we've been in our relationships series. Relationships. <laughs> we kicked it off focusing on relationships with mothers on Mother's Day. It was an amazing message from Masande. And then we went into relationships with friends. And then last week, you talked about relationship with self. And one of the things that you pointed out that I thought was so interesting was that a lot of times in relationships, we don't necessarily have a blueprint. We're not True. told how to be in relationship. And so today we're going to continue in our relationship series and we're going to be talking about romantic relationships, relationships between a man <laughs> and a woman romantically. <laughs> but I think before we, we get into the word, we need to keep in mind mm. the time and the context of what is going on. During this time, women were treated and seen as possessions. Mm. And so you'll see some of this interaction with, within the scripture. We are in 2022. Mm. If, if you are. try to roll like this right now, <laughs> it, will, it will probably not go well <laughs> with you. But I think there are some things that we can pull out yeah. of this interaction that they have that sure. can help us in our relationship. Yeah, for sure. So in the scripture today, um, as Monty pointed out, we see that Ruth has gone with Naomi back to her homeland. So she's in an unfamiliar place. This isn't her home. This isn't like her normal territory, the land where she lives. She was, she's a Moabite. Yes, she was married to an Israelite man, but she's in a place that she's not experienced before. She's not mm -hmm. used to the customs. She's not used to the culture, the laws, or the traditions um, that are held here in this new place that she's in. And so she's having to learn how to navigate this new place. And in navigating this new place, we see that Ruth is very open-minded. She's open to the experience and the wisdom and the knowledge of her mother-in-law Naomi, who is from this area, and she's trusting in Naomi's wisdom and knowledge. Initially, when Naomi tells Ruth, you know, go, <laughs> you can do better someplace else, you shouldn't stay with me, she's, Ruth's response is, no, I'm going to stay. And so in this relationship between these two women, in Ruth's willingness to stay with Naomi, we see that both of them have this genuine care and this genuine concern for one another. Um, so Ruth knows that Naomi cares about her. 
right? And so as Naomi has given her these instructions to follow, she moves forward in them out of that trust in Naomi. So Ruth, she's been in the fields. She's interacted with Boaz. He's making, made provision for her. So she's aware of what's happening around her. And she follows Naomi's instructions, and she waits until Boaz has eaten, until he's had something to drink, and he goes and <laughs> he lays down. <laughs> and so this wisdom that Naomi has shared with her has allowed her to know what to do in this situation that she's never been in before, that she's never encountered before. And sometimes I think for us, you know, when we encounter things, we feel like things that we've never experienced before, we feel like, okay, I got this. I can do this on my own, right? Even though maybe God has placed someone in our lives who's had experience in what we're, ex what we're dealing with, who has knowledge about what we're dealing with, we think that we can do it on our own. But the truth is, it's better to get advice. It's better to get counsel. It's better to lean into the people that God has placed in our lives that have the knowledge and have the wisdom that are going to help us even work through these unknown experiences that we may have. And so Ruth approaches Boaz, just like Naomi tells her to. She takes the covers off of his feet and she lays down. It's interesting to me <laughs> that she lays down at his feet, right? She's, he's seen her in the fields before. Ruth has also given her instruction to clean herself up, put on some nice clothes, and to anoint herself with some oil. And she uncovers his, uncovers his feet and lays at his feet. And it's, so it's not a sexual suggestion, right? It's not normal for a woman to lay at a man's feet thinking that that was going to be like a sexual thing, right? So she's, as, as her kinsman redeemer, which during that time, a kinsman redeemer was someone who, if all of the men in the family died, the next closest relative would then marry the widow in order to carry on the name of the widow's husband. And so Ruth, she has every right to go into the threshing floor expecting Boaz to marry her. She has that right um, to think that, you know, she's going to marry him, they're going to have kids, and she'll be able to carry on her husband's name. But Naomi gave her some really good advice. She gave her the advice to not go in demanding what was rightfully hers, but to go in humility. And so the position that Ruth has taken laying at his feet, it's one of humility. It's also one of respect. It's also one of trust in Boaz. And so these instructions that she's following from Naomi, they've allowed her to go in with all of these things, with trust, with respect, and with humility. And I also think there's, we can get caught up into gender roles. I think as we read in the story because of the time, mm. it's not only for, I think, the woman to act and walk in humility, but yeah. It's also for the male, yes. the male to, to live that out in that way as well. So I think as we, even as we're talking about these things, they're not gender specific. No. But these are things that I think everybody can take and, and apply. I remember when we were married our first year, we did long distance. Woo! And there's a lot of studies that go around and says in your first year, you are in the honeymoon phase. Yeah, everything is perfect in the first year, right? Everything's good, nobody can do any wrong. Mm -hmm. Your body actually releases a chemical called oxytocin that helps you sustain this honeymoon phase. And then what happens is, typically after year one, you come off of the honeymoon phase, the chemicals, they, they, they calibrate a little bit, and then you begin to enter into more of a, a, a realistic, state or phase where you begin to get a rhythm, you begin to um, enter into some sort of like normalcy. And I remember, because we did long distance off our first year, year I two. I it was like very interesting. Yes. But year two was, was really, really difficult because we were, we were coming together. Mm. And we were coming together and it seemed like we just kept like, uh, just kept bumping hitting, heads. yeah, bumping heads and hitting a wall. 
And I didn't understand why. Why does it now <laughs> something that and somebody that could say no wrong is now irritating me? Mm. So it's like the, the, this shift just happened uh, really quickly and very, <laughs> very <laughs> drastically. And so I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated and I'm processing and I'm trying to figure out what was actually happening was is that Kimberly's different, I'm different. We also come from a different culture. Yeah. So although we both black, African-American, yeah. we, we have a different culture, right? We come from a, we grew up in different areas of, of the states. Yeah. We had different values. There's different things that have formed and shaped who we are. And we found ourselves in a relationship now trying to figure life out, trying to reconcile these things and bring them together. <laughs> and I'm, I'm frustrated because I don't know how to do that. But then I also, I don't know how to ask for help <laughs> because I'm too prideful. <laughs> I don't want to go ask anybody. I don't want somebody to think uh, that I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you run the struggle bus? Yeah, I'm leading people within our church context, but I can't even lead myself in our relationship. Mm. And so I was struggling. And I thank God <laughs> for a Naomi in my life. Me too. There was an older seasoned man who saw me. He saw through my stuff. Mm. He saw me struggling. And he very gently and politely uh, came and asked me, uh, did I need some help and, mm. and, and wanted to walk with me? But now this puts the ball in my court, right? There's some responsibility that I had to actually receive the help that this man was offering. And I think maybe some of us, because we've come out of a church reference and there's been some relationships in our life and there's been this power dynamic where it's been controlling or maybe there's been some abuse within it um, and you asking for permission to do stuff. I'm not talking about that type of relationship, <laughs> but I am talking about one where there's counsel, where there's wisdom. I am talking about one where there's somebody in in my life that can look me in my eyes and say, Monty, you wrong. Yeah. And for me to be open and receive it and receive that. And so this is where Ruth is at. This is where she finds herself <laughs> at. So she's she's laying at Boaz's feet and he's startled. Yeah. Right. Because one, women wouldn't have been at the threshing floor, let alone at that time of night. So he, he wakes up and he's startled and he's like, who are you? <laughs> and Ruth is like, it's your servant, Ruth. It's me. You know, the one you've been giving favor to out in the field, it's, it's me. <laughs> and then Ruth does something that Naomi did not instruct her to do. Mm -hmm. So Ruth was open for Naomi's guidance, but she also didn't lose herself in the instruction. Naomi tells her, lie at his feet and wait for him to tell you what to do. But Ruth actually says, spread your, <laughs> spread your sheet, cover me. <laughs> cover me, you are family redeemer. So we, we see her personality come out. Mm -hmm. We see her personhood come out. We see her authenticity come out. We see her being herself. She doesn't get lost in, this, in trying to navigate culture but she's still able to bring herself into that space. And so she, and she tells Boaz this, and I love how he responds. Mm -hmm. He said, Lord bless you. Boaz knew that his words in this moment were very meaningful. Mm -hmm. He knew in this moment that he couldn't speak loosely because Ruth had taken this risk. She is a foreigner. She is coming to the threshing floor. She doesn't know anybody. She's in a new country. She's trying to navigate culture. And he, speak, he speaks words of life. Yeah. Your tongue can be salt water or fresh water. Oh. Your tongue can destroy or it can give life. In this moment, Boaz is giving life to Ruth. Mm. As we are navigating and we're in relationships, be meaningful 
with your communication. Don't say stuff loosely, but understand how your words impact and they affect people mm. and be intentional about how you're using them. Yeah. So he says this and then he begins to talk about Ruth's character. He's talking about how she's been loyal to her, her mother-in-law, how she has this reputation. So he blesses her. He talks about her character and then he says, you could have gone after a rich, a, a, another man, a rich or a poor man, but you've chosen me. There's mm. something inside of you that is, that is admirable. That, that Boaz is inspired by. You know, you, you could have done so many other things, but, but this is the route that you've chosen to go. And so Boaz is, he's honoring mm -hmm. Ruth in this moment, yeah. and he's sharing these things with her. Yeah, I can remember another story from when we were newly married. Um, shortly after our son Caleb was born, um, there was a point in our relationship where I, too, struggled a little bit. It's good to hear. Yeah. And my <laughs> struggle was, so I didn't grow up um, with, as you know, my biological father. I didn't grow up having my dad around. And so when Caleb was born, I had these expectations of my husband mm. as the father of my, my child. And my expectations were here. I can, I can be honest about that because in my mind, I had created this fairy tale version of what my husband was supposed to look like as a father. And so I put these expectations on him and I found myself like really getting upset sometimes and we would have these really intense conversations around my expectations of him as a father because I would I would want him to do all of these things that I had created in my head. I wanted the picture in my head to be a reality. I wanted him to sit and stare at Caleb while he was sleeping or hold him and read him a book and do all of those types of things. And I remember there was one day where we had had like this really intense conversation around what was going on in the come relationship. To, come to Jesus meet. Yes, he likes to call it our come to Jesus me <laughs> moment. And he sat me down and he said, listen, I cannot be the father that you didn't have. Not only that, he then proceeded to tell me, but this is what I can do. This is the type of father that I can be. I can teach my son that I love him. I can teach him to love God. I can teach him how to pray. I can teach him how to play football. I can do all of these things and be his father based off of the example that you were given from your dad. And you basically set expectations for me. You brought me down. Realistic expectations. Realistic expectations <laughs> for me. And in doing that, in communicating that, in setting these expectations, it helped me to see what was really happening and it went a long way in our relationship because I wasn't getting upset anymore over these things that I was expecting and not receiving because you had been extremely clear in what you were able to provide. And, and you set expectations for me, which is what, um, yeah, I think Boaz has done for Ruth. And then right after he shares with her his intentions, what he's going to do, he immediately starts to think about her safety and her well-being. You mentioned that women weren't supposed to be on the threshing floor mm -hmm. at that time of night, and so he tells her to stay the night, but leave in the morning before it's too light for people to recognize her, right? So he's thinking about her safety. He's telling her to stay because he thinks, he's thinking about what's in her best interest this late at night. And then he says that he's gonna go talk to the closer family redeemer in the morning. In the morning. The next morning, guys. In the morning. <laughs> the next morning. <laughs> so he's giving her specific times. He's giving her specific days, specific dates of when these things are going to happen because this thing is, like, urgent for him. He's, like, serious about having this relationship with Ruth. He ain't playing no games. He's not leaving it to chance. He's not saying, okay, there's a closer family redeemer. I'm just going to wait and see what he does, see if he comes to marry you. No. He says, I'm going to go talk to the dude first <laughs> and see if this is what he wants. Not only that, guys, he is 
allowing things to take course naturally. He's trusting God in this process of his relationship with Ruth. He is also honoring the traditions and the laws and the values of his day in saying that I'm gonna go and talk to this other guy and see what his intentions are. So he's working towards honoring everyone who's involved in the situation so that nobody can say that he didn't do it right. Nobody can speak ill of the process that he and Ruth go through. And so he's not trying to force the relationship. He's trusting God that things are gonna work out. Um, and I think a lot of times for us in relationships, we can find ourselves in a place where we might get frustrated with the process or we might get impatient with the timing of how things are happening. And we may even start to resent some of the traditions that need to be followed and some of the laws. Um, but here with Boaz and Ruth, we see the character of Boaz come out. We see his patience come out. We see his integrity come out in allowing things to take their course and be concerned with Ruth and her safety. No, I think another thing that I see in Boaz is he communicates well and he communicates with, with specificity. Is that a word? With what? You mean specificity? <laughs> <laughs> but his communication, it, it's clear. Yeah. He's not, um, he doesn't have all the answers, right? That's not what we're saying. Mm. And I think sometimes in our communication, we think healthy communication is having the answer. It's not. No, it's just communicating clearly. Mm. If you don't have the answer, then communicate. I don't have the answer and this is where I'm at. Mm. This is healthy communication and Boaz is able to do that. He's able to say, this is what's gonna happen. Yeah. This are my, these are my intentions. This is when it's gonna happen. Um, and I think that gives Ruth confidence. I think confidence and peace probably. Yes. Yeah. Um, because he's not uh, what I call wasting her life <laughs> because he hasn't communicated clearly. And I think I, I'm, I'm speaking from a guy's standpoint. I think we've done a lot of harm sometimes mm. because we haven't communicated our intentions very well. Even if our intentions is, hey, we just want to just hang out, then communicate that. Yeah. Um, but we haven't done that well. And then I think it's the flip side of that also for women is, oh, yeah. is to communicate clearly what your expectations are, what you want, and don't just think that the man knows that I'm not trying to waste my life, <laughs> right? The other thing we see Boaz do is he starts to think about not only his reputation, but also Ruth's. Yeah. So she's there at the time of the night what they've done is innocent, it's genuine. Um, God is moving in it, but he also understands <laughs> if people see her coming out of the threshing floor at that time of night, yeah. where people's minds will go. Yeah. So he tells her to lay down here. He says, wait till the morning before it's daylight, then you can begin to go home. So he knows that Ruth has built up this good reputation within the community, yeah. and he wants to honor that. He He's also a man of integrity and character. Yeah. And he wants to protect that as well. So they are protecting each other. Yeah. They are working together mm -hmm. to honor each other and to protect each other's reputation. Yeah, it's not one-sided. They both have a hand in it. And then I love what he does next. He says, take your cloak. <laughs> Bring your cloak here. And he takes and he, he measures out like six, six scoops of barley. Six scoops of barley and he puts it in a cloak and then he ties it up and then he, and he puts it on the back and he says, take this home to your family. Hmm. He does not want her to go home empty handed. Mm -hmm. So his care transcended Ruth, but his, his, his care also, he, he cared for the family. Yeah. This was a couple of months ago, pastors, Kuketso and, and Tato, they came and they, uh, they shared, uh, celebrating our sixth year, and we were supposed to pick them up at the airport. <laughs> Their flight got delayed a couple of times. Several times, yeah. So we ended up going to the airport really late. 
And as we're there, <laughs> they, it's not just them that they're with their family. So the family was supposed to get a rental and they were going to another location and then we were gonna take them to their accommodations. So I'm thinking, we get into the airport, they're gonna get in their rental and they're gonna go to where they need to go and we're gonna go to where we need to go. But we end up <laughs> having to take his family into the CBD. Yeah, right? he followed us into the CBD. It's like 12 o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> so we get to the accommodation, then Kuketsu, he goes in and there's some, there's some different things that are going on with their check-in. He stays there for maybe 45 minutes to an hour, mm. making sure that Tato's family gets their stuff right and get to where they need to get. Mm. They didn't, he didn't let one bag <laughs> not get loaded into the elevator. And then we still have to take them to their place after this. But I was really challenged. I was challenged by his, his care, not only for Tato, but, but for her family. Yeah. I think as we are, <clears throat> as we are thinking about relationships and, and interactions, I wanna, we want to encourage you, I think with these things here, I think one, lean into people who have walked the journey and the path before you. Yeah. We all come from different cultures and backgrounds and we have different stuff that has shaped us and we need to lean into the wisdom yes for sure um, of those people that can that can help us and be vulnerable enough to do that yeah and then also communicate well um communicate clearly um and if you don't have the answer be okay with saying i don't know but just be clear in saying, I don't know. So then there's no misconstrued expectations and everything is, is clear. No, I also think in the communication, um, I think be intentional, be, be meaningful in, in what you're mm -hmm. communicating and how you're communicating. Uh, one of the first things that he said to her was, Lord bless you. And so in our relationships, our tongues can, can build our partner up or, or they can tear them yeah. down. And then we, we both must look out for each other's safety. We must honor each other. Yes. Honor the things within our, within our family dynamics. Yes. Uh, Even honoring the differences in our cultures and in our families. And I think like knowing that your family is my family and my family is your family and caring for each other in that and for our families in that as well yeah so <laughs> we would like to end by praying for you guys today yeah. uh kimberly will you yes i will you started off and i'll end it okay god we thank you so much um we thank you for each and every relationship that you've given to us we thank you for the learnings that we've had in those relationships. We thank you for the Naomi's that you've sent us in relationship. We thank you that our hearts and our minds are open to receive from those people that you put into our lives to bless us with their wisdom and with their knowledge when it comes to relationships. Um, I thank you, God, that even in our differences within relationships, that we would come to a common ground, um, that we would seek to gain understanding of those differences and not to push against them, not to fight against them, but to be on the same team and recognize that we're in this together. I thank you for your presence today. I thank you for, yeah, just, <laughs> I even wanna say thank you for the challenges that we endure in our relationships. And thank you that even in those, you're sending us constant reminders that you are with us, even in those challenges, that we would lean into you, lean into your word, and again, lean into those people that you've placed in our lives to help us through those challenges. And I just speak a blessing over every relationship, over, um, yeah, just our relationships with ourselves, with our friends, um, with our significant others, God, that your hand would be in every relationship and that your word and the things that you speak to us 
would serve as the blueprint for our relationships. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Maybe you are watching today and you feel something going on in, inside of you. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit prompting you, helping you understand and know your need for Jesus. He's knocking on the door of your heart today and he wants to dine with you. He wants to be in relationship with you. So my prayer is that you say yes. Yes to his friendship, yes to relationship with him, yes to his will, yes to his way, yes to his governance in your life. We pray that even right now that you would feel like his tangible presence wherever you're watching from today and you would know that he's real. God, we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you, you're going to say something. No, go ahead. If you prayed that prayer today, uh, we'd love to follow up with you. We'd love to get connected with you. Uh, there's going to be a WhatsApp number that's going to pop up on the screen. You can message that number uh, below and one of our team here locally will follow up with you. You can also go to the website. There's a connect card that you can fill out mm -hmm. and one of our team will follow up. And then there are people that are in the chat right now uh, ready to pray with you and to seal this thing that has, has happened in your heart.